then um, people might uh, join in as as um, as the meeting goes on. We're very lucky today to have um, Bruno Amable with us today. Bruno is a professor at the University of Geneva at the um, Department of History, Economics and Society, which I think is an excellent grouping of, of subjects to, to put into one department. Um, Bruno won the prize for best young economist in, in France um, very recently. And um, his work is on not that recently. His work is on productivity, on technology, on, on how um, institutions, including social institutions, can, can change productivity growth, innovation, the, the development of technology. But he's also done work on um, typologies of capitalism, so engaged with the varieties of capitalism framework, but kind of very much moving beyond that in the tradition of the, the French regulationist school. And recently, he's been doing very interesting work on the reconfiguration of political cleavages, so the, the kind of political dividing lines, the, the social blocks that structure political competition in, in, in Western democracies, and in particular in France. And um, he's written a book that I personally found, found very insightful on, on kind of the rise of Macron um, and the social block that, that underpins it, or that Macron is trying to build, that underpins it. And we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, in due course. Uh, for now, I will I will pass the word to to Bruno, who will talk for about ten to fifteen minutes. Then we'll we'll have a bit of a, a Q and A back and forth between Bruno and myself. And then you can you can also submit questions to to Slido. And then towards the end, I will pick questions from from Slido um, and and put them to to Bruno. And with that, um, the the floor is yours. Thank you, Max. <coughs> oh, the young economist. It was a few decades ago, obviously. Um, otherwise, I would have uh, had a pretty extensive notion of what Jung means. Um, so I um, just wanted to um, just expose a few facts about um, the results of the um, of, of the election, the recent election. So I mean, um, it looks as if um, 2022 was uh, a repetition of the previous uh, presidential election because we pretty much uh, had the same final, the same second round uh, with exactly the same results. And in a way, we also had a continuation of the trends we observed in 2017 regarding uh, the demise of the uh, traditional party structure um, we had the fall of the Socialist Party, uh, the PS. Uh, I mean, that fall uh, led them somewhat even uh, um, deeper. Um, we had something which was uh, not very much pronounced in 2017, which is very clear now. Uh, the breakup of the traditional Conservative Party, the post gaullists um, Les Républicains, as they are now called, uh, and we had the consolidation of the movement that appeared in 2017, uh, uh, Emmanuel Macron's movement, uh, La République uh, en Marche. Um, but um, you also have um, uh, the continuation of another trend, which is uh, the so-called uh, Front Républicain, Republican Front, meaning uh, the alliance of uh, everybody against the National Front uh, candidate in the second round. The Front Républicain is extremely weakened. Um, in 2002, 20 years ago, when Jacques Chirac was opposed to uh, Jean-Marie Le Pen, what he got was 80% of the votes. Um, in 2017, um, Macron got 67% of the vote. And this time round, he got 58% um, uh, of the vote of, yeah, 58. And if you take into account the participation, actually only got 38% uh, of the electorate. Um, it, you could even argue that actually the, the so-called Republican Front is an alliance of everybody against uh, Mélenchon's party, but we can come Come back to that if if you if you wish. So why um, I mean what what uh, does it mean that this Republican Front is uh, is um, is is weakened? Uh, well, uh, the appearance is is the following: the fact that um, in two thousand and seventeen Macron obtained around about twenty million votes in the second round, and this time round he got eighteen million. 
So he lost, uh, he lost uh, 2 million votes uh, in, in five years. And Marine Le Pen gained 2.6 million votes. So you can see that uh, there is still an advantage uh, in favor of Macron. This uh, uh, vote advantage is actually going down. <clears throat> um, what this election made clear also is that uh, the traditional position in, in the uh, political life in France is no longer between two different blocks, a left block and a right block, but between three different blocks this time. Um, the, uh, I won't go too, too much into this idea of uh, social block, which is the basis of uh, uh, Stefano Palomparini and, and I, uh, the work we will have Stefano Palomparini and I do, um, but uh, the social block, which is uh, supporting uh, Macron, in which Macron uh, is also uh, uh, trying to consolidate uh, the so-called bourgeois bloc, as we uh, named it. Uh, this bourgeois bloc has been extended. Uh, the, the, the challenge for Macron when he was elected in 2017 was actually to, to extend uh, the social base that he was relying on, and he has uh, succeeded in doing that. So in a way, he has achieved uh, the political objective that he had set himself, uh, for himself in 2017. And this bourgeois bloc has been extended in the direction of social groups that form formerly um, belonged to the right-wing bloc. So the bourgeois bloc has been uh, ex extended to, uh, to the right. Um, if you look at uh, the um, uh, polls, you can see that um, the most important addition to uh, the electoral base of Macron uh, is um, retirees. Uh, retirees who typically voted uh, more in favour of uh, right-wing candidates before. So they actually uh, moved from a traditional vote in favour of the right wing to a traditional, to, well, a new traditional vote in favour of Macron. Uh, for the rest, uh, so from a sociological point of view, uh, Macron's uh, electoral base is rather uh, the same as in uh, 2017, meaning that uh, underrepresentation of the uh, working class, overrepresentation of the um, um, <coughs> skilled, uh, well-off, etc. Um, skilled, uh, that's, uh, that's a typical representation of, um, of, of the, the social base of Macron, and that's why we, Stefano Barini and I, we called the social bloc the bourgeois uh, bloc. Um, an interesting thing to note is that uh, when Macron won in 2017, he won because he was able to aggregate a social base uh, consisting of social groups coming from the traditional right bloc and social groups coming from the traditional left bloc. And Macron's policy during the five years between 2017 and 2022 um, has been very pretty much right wing, both in terms of economic policy and also in terms of social policy. So you could have said that, okay, he was elected on, uh, per, you know, he purported to be, uh, to be neither left nor right, or both left and right, but it was pretty much right. Um, but this um, right-oriented policy did not scare uh, the social groups uh, coming from, from, from former uh, uh, left-wing bloc. So those left-wing bourgeois uh, stuck with Macron. It did not desert Macron in, in favour of uh, other left-wing uh, uh, candidates. Um, the second uh, block, both social and political, is an authoritarian block, and is not. I would say is not. Uh, this block is not stabilized. Uh, although being apparently solid, um, so far the, re the political representation of this block was uh, the job of uh, the different incarnation of uh, Front National, Rassemblement National, etc with uh, different members of the Le Pen family as, uh, as a candidate. And I say it's solid because 
Uh, I don't know if you've uh, noticed, but the campaign of Marine Le Pen was pretty much low key for two types of reason, and money problems, and something which is not unrelated, the fact that the association with uh, Putin and, and Russia was a bit of an embarrassment in the context of the Ukraine war. So the, uh, in spite of the slow key campaign, I mean, Marine Le Pen had a better uh, result this time uh, uh, in a rather uh, incompetent in 2017. When I say it's not uh, consolidated, it, because if part of the social groups from the former right-wing bloc have joined uh, the bourgeois bloc of Macron, the slaves part of the uh, right-wing social groups that have not, not joined uh, Macron to actually potentially join this bloc. Uh, and this also explains why uh, the uh, candidate of the traditional uh, right-wing uh, party, uh, who is Valérie Pécresse uh, this time, she made a miserable uh, uh, score, miserable re electoral result, <clears throat> less than 5%, whereas uh, in 2017, Fiel, who is representing the same uh, party, um, uh, obtained 20%. So uh, the electoral score was divided by uh, four, which is uh, more than half, actually, which is uh, um, really a, a blow to the traditional uh, uh, right-wing conservative uh, uh, party. So, I mean, these blocks potentially can join the other regime uh, uh, bloc. And this extension is also reflected in, in the score of <clears throat> another far-right candidate, Zemmour, who would have thought, thought that it was possible for Zemmour to actually take <clears throat> um, the electorate, part of the electorate of Le Pen, away from, from the Rassemblement National, but that was not the case. Actually, the addition of Zemmour as a candidate was an addition to the uh, electoral score of the, uh, the far-right. <clears throat> And actually, Le, uh, Zemmour did not take any votes from Le Pen because actually he took his votes in a very bourgeois uh, part of the electorate, ex exactly a part that uh, Le Pen is not able to reach. Uh, it's really funny to, to look at the, uh, the cities where Zemmour is comparatively uh, very strong. Saint-Tropez, uh, Neuilly, uh, Versailles, uh, all, all these uh, very, very well-off, very bourgeois uh, areas, very different from, from the traditional constituencies of, uh, of Le Pen. So these blocking are stabilized, they could be extended with the elements I've mentioned, but the difficulties, of course, would have to be uh, 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 dealing with the possible and existing contradictions between the, uh, the aspirations of the traditional social constituency of uh, electoral constituency of Le Pen and the bourgeois right wing far right, which I've uh, mentioned and uh, which voted for Zemmour this time. And the third social uh, bloc would be the eco socialist or socialist ecological uh, left bloc. <clears throat> political representation being the movement led by uh, Jean-Luc Mélenchon, Mélenchon, La France, uh, Insoumise. Uh, this block is obviously not stabilized, but uh, was successful to actually take uh, the precedence over the uh, attempts by the other so-called left uh, parties to actually represent the, the whole of the left. Uh, as I've said uh, the PS, uh, the Socialist Party this time made an absolutely miserable score. Um, and the hope probably for the Socialist candidate was to actually gain, uh, regain the social groups of the left, the former left bloc, which had supported Macron in 2017, but would have been uh, disappointed by Macron and would have voted this time for for the PS because they would have thought that Macron was too right wing. But I explained before this did not take place. So basically, the PS had no social block, <laughs> no social basis any longer, and this is reflected in the uh, in, in the the absolute uh, terrible uh, electoral results which they got this time, less than two percent. 
Uh, and uh, the same thing to an extent um, uh, applies to the uh, Green Party's uh, result, which was also not very good. Uh, and the same sort of reason, really, not having a social basis any longer, torn between, um, uh, you know, um, the, the candidate is is not very credible as as um, as a typical ecologist because he's, he's some sort of left wing neoliberal. Oh, uh, sorry, ecological neoliberal. So uh, the ambiguity was uh, was to his detriment actually because the uh, neoliberal voted for for, for uh, Macron. And uh, the, uh, the ecological non-neoliberal voted for um, for Mélenchon. So uh, that again explains why uh, uh, this candidate didn't make much of an impression. Um, so this <clears throat> leaves um, a possible uh, left-wing bloc uh, represented by uh, by. Um, uh, Mélenchon and La France as um, the, the very good result of Mélenchon, who almost made it to the second round, uh, is due to the fact that he was able to actually achieve one of the aims that was um, set uh, after the defeat in 2017, which was to mobilize the, abstain the people who abstain from voting, and especially um, people uh, from, uh, from the working class. And uh, this was partly achieved. Um, um, so most of the gains actually come from uh, young people and people from popular uh, categories and not from, uh, from, from other categories. There are gains in other categories, of course, but the main gains can come from, from, from this. Where uh, it wasn't enough because, um, and this would be probably, um, uh, an aim, uh, um, a goal to, to pursue uh, for, for, for the coming years and, and maybe for the next election in, in, uh, in a few weeks, which would be to mobilize um, the working classes that did not vote. And these are possibly working classes which still voted for, uh, for the and, and National Front. And if you look at um, the geography of the votes, you can see that these people actually uh, are located in, uh, in small towns or in rural areas. So uh, the fact that uh, La France Insoumise did not um, reach uh, to, to these uh, uh, popular classes is is probably where uh, the um, an indication of where the, uh, the, the next um, target in electoral terms uh, uh, would be. Um, okay, I've been too long, I think. Uh, so I think I'd, I'd rather stop here and uh, let you uh, uh, well, have questions if you want. Fantastic. Well, thank you. Thank you for the for the overview so far. Um, we'll, we'll move on to the Q&A now. I, I have a few questions prepared and a few more popped into my head as, as Bruno was giving his overview. And then in addition, we're collecting questions on, on Slido. So if you have questions, um, then, then go to the Zoom chat and click on the link and you can type in your questions there. And also very important for the quality of the questions. If you don't have any questions yourself, you can click on the link and then you can vote up questions that you think are important and should be asked and so that way we I can make sure that I pick the questions that get the most vote and that will be the questions that kind of represent your 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 interests and um, so the the first question Bruno that that I wanted to ask you it it comes out of this um demise of the traditional parties that you just explained right kind of in 2017 we saw the the cratering of the party socialist and then this time around, the, the Républicain followed suit, and now really there's this unusual situation in France that really the, the traditional parties, at least at the presidential level, seem to have become deeply, deeply uncompetitive. What's very interesting, looking at France from the outside, is this, this seems to be France being ahead of the curve in a process that is taking place in other countries, other Western democracies as well, where the kind of traditional party system is changing, is fragmenting same in the Netherlands, arguably in the US. Um, but I was wondering, so what are the processes underneath this party political change? So I know in, in your book, you say a little bit about the, the economic forces and, and, and kind of the, the deeper changes that explain 
the, the demise of the old blocks and the, the emergence of this three block structure. And I was wondering, because I think there, there, there'll be people in the audience who, who haven't read your book yet. So I think it would be great if you could kind of explain a little bit of the argument from your book and what explains this uh, demise of the old and rise of the three new blocks that, that you just laid out for us. Yeah, the, <clears throat> the analytical grades of the uh, theory that uh, uh, Stefano Brambarini and I um, uh, consider is this idea that in order to have um, a political situation which is stable, you would have to have a, a political strategy which is uh, supported by a social base, which we call a social bloc. Uh, and, and this political strategy uh, actually implies a, a particular socioeconomic model. But, uh, it's, it's probably something that we won't have time to discuss. Um, the traditional situation in France is that you would have uh, two social blocs that would be competing for political domination. And we, we can call them left and right because the political strategies were pretty much left and right. Over uh, the past decades, from the 1980s on, these two blocs have been fractured for a variety of reasons um, with internal tensions. Because uh, when, when we say, uh, a social block which is stable it's it's never it doesn't mean that it's stable for um, for eternity um <clears throat> and so in, inside the left block and inside the right block you would have tensions which would make the political strategy un, strategies uniting these blocks incredibly uh, difficult to to be sustained it's very clear for instance in the left block where the political strategy of the government left would be to pursue uh, uh, European integration. And this, uh, this in European integration would mean implementing a particular type of macroeconomic policy and a particular type of structural reforms, uh, uh, namely some neoliberal reforms. And of course, this wouldn't do well with the, um, with the uh, traditional social base of the left. So you would, that would explain why some parts of the, some social groups of the left uh, block would be rather satisfied with the options uh, chosen by the Socialist Party or the government left, whereas some social groups would be uh, very unhappy. And this would lead to uh, the left block being actually fractured. The same story or a similar story, not the same, but a similar story could be said about, um, uh, about the right bloc uh, as a similar, but not the same, but not going into details. So you've got these blocks, which are no longer very stable, um, not very much united any longer. And you've got the possibility to actually unite some groups of the left groups of the left bloc and some groups of the right bloc and try to find, to to aggregate a new block. And this new block would be composed of um, skilled, rather well-off uh, individuals or social groups that would be in favor or not, at least not too hostile to uh, European integration and neoliberal reforms. And um, actually the Socialist Party has tried to aggregate this block and failed. Failed because um, still uh, part of the Socialist Party was, uh, I mean, the Socialist Party itself was not ready to actually make the move that would be radical enough to actually aggregate this, uh, this new block. And the person who was uh, um, credible and was, who was ready to make a radical move to actually do that was Macron. So he succeeded in 2017 in what the Socialist Party <coughs> had been failing, uh, most notably with, uh, with Holland, uh, and, uh, and he aggregated uh, a new bloc. And this is why I say it, you no longer have a, a partition of the political space, which is consisting of two blocs, or you've got three blocs, okay? You've got the remain, what remains of the left bloc, You've got the, uh, what remains of the right block, and you've got uh, the, uh, the the bourgeois block. 
I could have added that uh, the uh, surge of the National Front in the 1980s and the uh, growing importance of the National Front in the uh, in the fourth in the following decades was also something that contributed to the demise of the right bloc, obviously, and which explains why the rem what remains of the uh, the right bloc after the formation of the bourgeois bloc has not gone to uh, <coughs> supporting the traditional uh, Republican, uh, um, Les Républicains, the traditional uh, <coughs> conservative uh, party, but actually has more naturally joined uh, the, uh, the, 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 the political uh, representation of the far right. Um, okay, so that that's this uh, this uh, you know in order uh, that maybe I mean in in the theory that Stefan O'Brien Arini and I we consider it's never only the political party strategy or only the expectations of the different social groups, but it's the fact that actually the expectations are actually formed and satisfied both formed and satisfied by the political strategies of the different parties. And this is some sort of, uh, you know, some sort of um, fixed point, if we want to use a mathematical metaphor, uh, uh, that gives a political uh, a stable situation. And it worked for, uh, uh, for, for Macron, and it hasn't really worked for the two of the blocs, which I mentioned uh, on the left and on the right. Uh, uh, so far, and the fact that the PS, the Socialist Party, has failed so miserably. And I was, you've got to consider that in 2012, um, Hollande is elected uh, uh, president. But the Socialist Party is dominating the political life like no other party has ever done it uh, in the Fifth Republic before, not even De Gaulle had such a, 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 a prominence. The Socialist Party had the presidency, the National Assembly, the, the absolute majority in the National Assembly, the Senate, all the regions but one, uh, all the large cities. So, I mean, as I've said, in the Fifth Republic, no party was that dominant, not even De Gaulle, not even, you know, et cetera. Ten years later, the Socialist Party candidate makes 1.72% at the presidential election, okay? And even five years later, uh, um, uh, Hollande was such uh, a failure that he did not dare to represent, to present, to present, to, to, con to compete for a second mandate. So you could say, well, it's because uh, Hollande is, uh, is is an idiot or his whole land is an incompetent. But that's not the case. Well, maybe he is, but it's, it's not the, the point. The point is that uh, the, the, the dominance of the Socialist Party in 2012 was based on something which was not existing any longer. And that means he, was, he had won on an ambiguity. And the ambiguity was I, uh, the left bloc votes for me uh, I will implement uh, uh, an economic and uh, generally uh, uh, all sorts, an economic policy, but even a social policy that is rather right wing. And I will try to change my supporting bloc from the left bloc to the, um, to the, the through the, the bloc bourgeois. And he failed in doing that. And which is why uh, uh, the Socialist Party being no longer left and not yet bourgeois failed so miserably. So you kind of tried to pull a Tony Blair or, or Gerhard Schröder, but couldn't get to the other side fast enough. And Macron kind of moved into the, the gap and kind of sweep, sweep that up. Um, 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 it's reasonably clear why he couldn't do a Tony Blair because uh, of the, uh, the differences in political institutions and you know, only two parties, blah, blah, blah. Um, but the Gerhard Schröder comparison is more complicated. And actually I would love to make the same for Germany, the same sort of analysis which I've made for France, 
and which uh, Stefano Parambarini and I have made for Italy, uh, and to see why it was possible for the SPD not to disappear after Gerhard Schröder, and why uh, it was bound for, uh, for failure, what the socialist, French Socialist Party uh, did. Mm. I mean, that would be that would be a fascinating discussion, and probably on on one side, I guess it would have to do with anything to the left of the SPD being uh, being mined territory, very difficult territory in German politics, in, at least in the early 2000s, because of associations with the, the East German Republic. And that may have protected Schröder's left flank to a stronger degree than, than Hollande felt comfortable with. And so maybe Schröder could move faster to the kind of bloc bourgeois than, than, than Hollande felt comfortable. But, um, before we get kind of sidetracked into, into the kind of German early 2000s, um, there was one, I think, implication of your analysis um, that I wanted to tease out and then see what you think about it, because it, it makes me very worried about the next election and maybe the election after that, right? So if, 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 we, if we take your analysis and say there's been this fracturing of the, the left block and the right block, and and we now have this situation where there's the bloc bourgeois roughly in the middle, although you know, left, right, middle no longer make fully sense in this new constellation, but let's kind of simplify in this way. Bourgeois bloc sitting roughly in the middle, cosmopolitan, Macronist, um, that kind of politics. And then there's the, the remnants of the left bloc that's maybe now slightly more nationalist than before, um, but clearly not willing to align on this globalist, nationalist, uh, anywhere, somewhere dimension with the, 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 the right block, the nationalist block. Um, and so you have these three blocks um, with at least kind of the, the globalist, nationalist dimension running across it, but also a kind of economically left, right dimension, and then probably also slightly separate cultural dimension. So in this landscape, I feel like there is, <laughs> there is no good, outcome for the next couple of presidential elections for the following reason. Either um, Le Pen, the Rassemblement National, succeeds in fully collapsing this triangle into, into kind of a, a two-block distribution, and it, it kind of really collapses into the uh, globalist, regionalist, nationalists, uh, somewhere, anywhere. And then once you have it collapsed down to, to two things, then the kind of laws of democracy tell you that eventually the opposition wins. But that would be deeply problematic. But the other scenario where this collapsing of the triangle back to, to a line where that doesn't happen, that's not much better. Because if you think it through, having, having the, the three blocks in play makes it nearly certain that the bloc bourgeois always wins. Right, because if it looks like the right bloc is going to win, then then the kind of Mélenchon supporters will, it seems, support the, the centrist. And I'm pretty sure that if it had been uh, the other way around and it would have been Mélenchon in the second round uh, against Macron, then in all likelihood, the, the vast majority of the, the right bloc voters would have converged in the middle. And then if so, if, if the triangle stays and we don't get a collapse to, to, to a line again, then you would have a situation where the bloc bourgeois always wins. And what kind of democracy is a democracy where you don't have regular turnover um, in, in, in kind of the highest levels of government? So either you'd be a scenario where it collapses, eventually the opposition wins, you get a right-wing government, or it doesn't collapse, and then you have kind of bloc bourgeois out into the future. And neither of these two scenarios seems good to me. So I'm wondering what you're making of this, if I'm missing something. Um, yeah, what are your thoughts about the next couple of elections? Maybe on the last point, the fact that the, uh, <clears throat> my impression is, and tell me if I'm wrong, that your implication that the bloc bourgeois always wins is that it's in a central position. Um, and I think there's, uh, it's not exactly that, because thinking that there would be some sort of intermediate between the far right and uh, the new left bloc, Mélenchon, for instance, is, is not really true because you've got to think really in, multi in a multi-dimensional setting. For instance, in economic policy terms, uh, you, you could even say that, uh, it's not entirely true, but you could even say that it's the national front 
we, oh, well, I know, called the Rassemblement National. Well, it's uh, Le Pen's movement, which is intermediate between uh, Mélenchon and uh, Macron. Uh, because in, in an, if, if you consider the neoliberal axis, uh, there is, uh, you've got two ends. At one end, you've got Mélenchon, and at the other end, you've got Macron. Uh, and, and the central position, which is not central, which is not in the center, by the way, would be uh, taken by the, uh, by the Rassemblement National. So um, centrist is, is something, uh, it is a notion that should be avoided when we talk about the bourgeois, because in many dimensions, it, is, it, it sits to one extreme of the, of the axis and not in the middle. Um, but regarding the, the more general question, um, it's a question precisely, I was saying it's a multi-dimensional space. And the question is, in, in what dimensions is, is the political competition going to take place? Um, if you consider that um, the, the neoliberal uh, steps taken so far are almost impossible to reverse, it's beneficial to both the uh, Macron, obviously, but also to the far right uh, bloc, because the far right bloc anyway is neoliberal as well. You know, contrary to, uh, and I know the foreign press in particular is, is totally uh, mistaken when talking about uh, some sort of social populism of the National Front, National, etc., which is not true at all. It might have been vaguely true a few years ago, but it's certainly no longer true. They haven't looked at the, uh, the current uh, manifesto of the Rassemblement National. Um, in a way, the Rassemblement National has gone back to the traditional economic roots of the, um, the far right in France, and it is very much uh, neoliberal and sometimes ultra liberal as well. As well. So, anyway, in, in terms of economic policy competition between the far right and Macron, they would it would take place in, in the same part of the, the economic policy space. So that means that the uh, differentiation between the two blocks would, would be a differentiation precisely in the terms you mentioned between um, openness versus uh, closeness, um, uh, globalism versus nationalism, et cetera, et cetera. And that would suit Macron perfectly and that would suit the, uh, the, the far right uh, perfectly as well. And the, the economic, the political forces that would be marginalized by this political competition would be the left, obviously. Um, uh, being, you know, trapped in, in uh, you know, um, and divided precisely, uh, divided precisely by these, by these nationalist versus globalist dimension. Because the, the 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 left block would be uh, the social groups um, of, of this new left block would be uh, uh, not uh, united in these uh, in, in these areas. Um, another possibility is that the uh, political competition precisely takes place in another dimension of the political space, and what would be determinant would be: uh, Do you want a neoliberal economic policy or an instructional policy? Or do you want something else? Do you want something that would be uh, ecological planification, social, you know, ec so social economic, uh, social ecological uh, uh, model, socioeconomic model, et cetera, et cetera. And then that would oppose the bourgeois bloc to, um, uh, to the new left bloc. And, and the far right would be both marginalized and split. Because as I've said, if you consider a united and stable far-right bloc, which, as I've, as I've said, is, is not existing yet. But you would have both um, popular classes and bourgeois, bourgeois social groups. And obviously, in the end, they would be uh, um, uh, against each other uh, when it comes to deciding, do you want more social protection or do you want less social protection? Do you want employment protection or do you want less, et cetera, et cetera? Um, do you want public services, et cetera? You know, that's, uh, the, uh, so the, the difficulties would be uh, for them to keep a united far-right bloc if the dominant political competition is expressed in terms of, um, of the socioeconomic model. But can I jump in there on the on on kind of the second scenario where 
political competition um, takes place on the ground of kind of economic visions, a kind of a, a neoliberal uh, market competition oriented one versus kind of social protection oriented one. Is it, is it really credible to imagine political competition taking place on that terrain in, in France today, given that within the kind of the single market within the Eurozone, France is at least relatively speaking, um, already quite far to, to the left of, of the spectrum, right? The, 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 the um, government to GDP spend, government spending to GDP ratio is, is I think it's the highest uh, in the European Union, social protection, again, relative to, to other European economies, social protection is quite high. And then kind of setting out and saying, look, we want to move even further in that direction. Um, and this is going to be kind of our, our banner. Is that something that will look credible um, is it something that can kind of win majority support, given that France is embedded in, in, in the European Union? Uh, as a, the issue usually is uh, no, it's because, again, Macron's policy is very radical and his plan is something very radical and the changes are going to be uh, uh, extremely radical. Um, they were not as radical as, as they could have been uh, during the first mandate uh, for two sorts of reasons. Uh, the first sort being social opposition, the famous uh, yellow vests, and the second was the pandemic. So it sort of slowed uh, uh, two, two or three major uh, um, reforms which uh, he, he wanted to, to implement. So, I mean, the question is not, do we want more? Um, uh, social services, blah, blah, blah. The question is, do you want to preserve the existing uh, uh, level, which is already dwindling, or do we, do, do we want to go down the, uh, the, the neoliberal slide? And the other dimension is uh, the ecological part, which is not to be uh, neglected. Um, and it is, uh, again, is something which is overlooked, especially in the foreign press, when they talk about Mélenchon. Usually they've got absolutely a zero understanding of Mélenchon's movement in foreign press. The fact that the ecological part has been uh, very important from, from day, day one, really. And the idea of uh, ecological planning, uh, which has been taken as a, as a slogan, has been taken up by Macron, by the way. Um, but the idea is serious on, uh, on Mélenchon's side. Uh, it, it is definitely part of the, um, uh, the opposition to uh, uh, the new liberal strategy. So in, in, in the environmental energy uh, 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 side of the problem, the idea is, is, do you want to deal with global warming with new liberal measures, such as, you know, uh, carbon price, etc., or do you want ecological planning? Do you want something which is obviously a, a socialist way of dealing with the problem. So <clears throat> that's also uh, uh, going to be an important dimension uh, uh, of political competition, if political competition takes place in the political space uh, that I've mentioned mm. previously. In that context, I find it very striking that Macron mentioned, I believe it was even before the first round or maybe between the first and second round, that he believes in more uh, planification in the energy sector. And, and that to me came as a bit of a surprise given his, his kind of general um, uh, yeah, approach to, to managing economic questions. It's time to move on to, to the Slido questions from the audience. And the first one, um, the most popular one there ties on quite nicely to what we've just been talking about. And the question is, in which policy areas do the various left parties differ so strongly that it prevented a unification behind Mélenchon? Um, it's um, the two uh, axes, I shouldn't say axes because they're not uh, orthogonal really, but uh, the two uh, axes of differentiation which broke up the left bloc, European integration, and again, to use a, a, a simple word, and neoliberal policy. So what prevented um, uh, the unification of uh, uh, Socialist Party and, and La France Insoumise, uh, uh, obviously was the fact that uh, the Socialist Party wanted to appear as, um, the pro-European integration party and not 
emit any criticism against uh, the uh, European integration process. And they wanted to uh, preserve uh, the heritage, what they, they called the heritage of the government left. And the heritage of the government left, left includes uh, what Holland had been doing uh, during his mandate. And that includes a certain number of uh, neoliberal reforms, including the infamous um, uh, uh, labor law reform, which was extremely uh, uh, radical. So, I mean, they were not ready to, re and they are now, if you're following the, <laughs> if you're following the news uh, and of what happens in the, in the negotiations at the moment, you can see that they actually are uh, uh, ready to relinquish this uh, heritage of, um, of, uh, of the government left. So that, that's why the PS could not obviously uh, uh, unite with, um, with La France Insoumise. Uh, the other reason was also that, um, you know, as, as I've said, 10 years ago, they used to be dominant in, 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 so they could not probably admit to themselves that they were a junior partner at best in, in uh, unless actually it was, uh, you know, uh, blatant by, by the result of, uh, of their candidate uh, in 2022. For the ecologists, uh, they're split actually. And, and the split uh, of, um, of, of the left bloc between, say, a left-wing fraction and a more neoliberal, you know, right-oriented fraction, that exists in the Green Party. So there was, uh, they made a primary to decide um, uh, what their candidate should be. And it was pretty much a 50-50 split between the left-wing candidates of the Green Party and the, I would say, right-wing candidates of the, of the Green Party and the right-wing candidate won the, by a very narrow uh, margin. And, <clears throat> and uh, this split, as you can say, is, is uh, at least this, um, this rift is, is, uh, is very much uh, present even until now. And, and uh, I probably would say that if the right, the left-wing candidate had won the primary, I would say that in the end, it would have been possible for her to actually join, uh, to, to unite with the, with the left-wing candidates before the first round. Mm -hmm. um, so the next question on Slido, I'll, I'll read out the question and then I'll, I'll give it a slightly sharper framing, I think. And so the, the question says, where's Macron? on the left-right axis with regard to European economic policy, does he continue the French position, which is contrary to the order liberal German one? Um, and I think that that question actually ties quite nicely to what you just said about the European question splitting the party socialist, because wouldn't one reading of this split be that really it's a kind of artificial split because the, the position of being kind of anti-European and prioritizing social protection over Kind of European issues, as we've seen with with Greece in 2015, it's it's if if it's kind of a out of Europe position, that's a complete dead end. So if you think, okay, it cannot be an out of Europe position, it would have to be a we will push for uh, a more left wing version at the European level. That would be kind of the, I guess the credible version of that. Then my question would be, how big, how much daylight is there between what Macron has been trying to do? Kind of sending all kinds of overtures towards Berlin and then being met with silence. How big would the gap be between the Macron approach at the European level and the kind of realistic left um, reformist approach to to Europe? Uh, yeah, it's, it's something. I mean, the, uh, I know that the perception of Macron, especially in Germany uh, and in the left in Germany, is more positive than I think it should be, uh, precisely because of this aspect. But you, you've got to see that what is the main objective of Macron? <coughs> the main objective of Macron is to implement neoliberal reforms so as to transform radically the socioeconomic model of France. Okay? And it is a European as far as this main objective is fulfilled. So European integration is obviously a, a, a positive <laughs> a positive thing in, in the pursuit of this objective. Um, and, but is, is not ideologically blocked on a particular macroeconomic policy option. So we'll choose 
<coughs> will choose the macroeconomic policy option that is the most favorable to the implementation of this objective, which is why he's very flexible. He is not, you know, he's, he's not a, a, a balanced budget fanatic. Uh, if <coughs> he wants Europe to go on, he wants European integration to go on because it serves its main objective. If the um, economic policy attitude of Germany is threatening the existence of the Eurozone because they're, because, you know, the Euro crisis, et cetera, et cetera, then of course he's going to be more left-wing than uh, the German position. Not because he's intrinsically more, more left-wing than German politicians, but because he thinks, and, I've, and for once I would agree with him, he thinks that the macroeconomic attitude, uh, position of Germany is actually not compatible with the existence of the Eurozone uh, uh, in, in, uh, in, uh, in the future. Okay, so I mean, um, in, a, in a way, he's far more pragmatic than the German politician, the average German politician. Uh, so, uh, and, and in, far, in fact, it could be considered as more, um, as, as more, uh, <coughs> as more pro-Europe than uh, the average German politician, mm. which is why, why part of the left-wing uh, uh, politicians in Germany like Macron mm -hmm. so much, uh, but they should not like him because he's pro-European. Uh, they should like him because um, they, they should at least they, they should realize why they like him. And they don't like him because he's left wing. They, they like him because he's, he's more pragmatic than, uh, than uh, Lindner or. Uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, so on a, on a kind of German political line, he would be somewhat left on the European questions, but it's not because he's kind of. In viewed with, with a left ideology, but because on the one hand, he thinks it's a favorable macroeconomic context for the kind of liberalization at home, a bit like Schröder running deficits in 2002, 2003, and because he's an actual pragmatist about the continued existence of the Eurozone. Exactly. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, okay, that actually makes a lot of sense. Um, <coughs> the, the next question from Slido, oh, that's an interesting one. Um, you know, we've been talking a lot about economic questions and economic differences and, and where the debate is and where people stand. But the, the next question on Slido is, where does the dissatisfaction of the French with politics come from? Is it exclusively for economic reasons? Um, being an economist, I would, I would tend to say, of course. Um, yeah, I would say that. <clears throat> Again, I, I'm sorry, but I'm I'm always using the same theoretical grid in interpreting these things. At least I can I can tell you what the theoretical grid I've got in mind is is able to say uh, in order to answer this question. The fact that um, for a long time, um, especially on the left side. Part of the electorate has voted for a policy which was not implemented by the politicians that they voted for. So, I mean, if if take the average working class left wing voter, he votes for a certain number of options, and once selected, the um, Socialist Party, for instance, um, go and go at great length as doing the opposite of what they were uh, elected for. And explain uh, that, oh yeah, we tried, but it's impossible. Um, and it has been a game played by the Socialist Party over, uh, you know, uh, the premise things, we're going to implement a left-wing economic policy and once selected, so they say, uh, it's impossible, you know, uh, the uh, European uh, um, constraints, uh, etc., and so on and so forth. So after a while, of course, the electorate is a bit uh, disappointed and is a bit uh, disillusioned. So, I mean, this feeds, of course, not only a disaffection towards the Socialist Party, but also uh, the fact that uh, is, there's no use in voting for these for left, left wing parties anyway, because they're, they're uh, first, if they win the election, they won't do what they set out to do. And uh, in any case, even if they wanted to do it, they wouldn't be able to do it. 
So, I mean, let's just stay out of it and not vote. But can I can I just jump in there for a second? Because it seems to me that this is a process that <laughs> politicians themselves see. And so th they would observe that they've made a set of promises. They were not able to deliver on this in the past term. They are being punished for that at the next election. And so you would think that when the next time round, the, whether it's kind of the left or the right, says we want to deliver, uh, either, either we want to deliver this, they really mean it. Or if they conversely say, we can't promise this because of European constraints, or we can't promise this for other constraints, that again, they're being genuine because they know that not being genuine is costly at the next election, right? So what, what uh, so, yeah, I'm sorry, we're running out of time. I, I, don't, I don't know if there is a general pattern here. And what, what I can say is what, what, was, um, what played in, in the French case. And the, the situation is a bit different from the right parties because it was <coughs> they did not in one of my books I think I've got an expression saying that um the the socialist party betrayed its constituency whereas the right wing party disappointed their constituencies and it's 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 not as as it's not as bad is it there were disappointments whereas the other ones were Worse than that. So I mean, because why? It's because the Socialist Party was busy trying to find another social bloc. They needed the left bloc in order to be um, elected, but once elected, they wanted to implement a policy that would win them the favour of a social bloc that did not exist. It was an almost impossible task, and they failed. Uh, the situation is a bit different on the right. They were trying to find a balance between the different, the contradictions, the different expectations of the social groups composing the, the, the right block. And it's a difficult thing. It's not impossible, but it's difficult. So they partly achieved that and they partly failed, etc. I mean, the, the, the big, um, the, you know, the, the betrayal, the, the really the big failure that was, that was on the left, that was not on the right. So we're we're coming up to eight o'clock, um, but I, I asked people to vote on the last question, so I, I feel I can't deny the last <laughs> question. Um, I'll ask that together with our traditional last question, um, which is, do you have a book recommendation? So first one, do you have a book recommendation for us? Can be a novel, can be can be uh, could be one of your books, could be could be an economics textbook. That's the one. And the second question, last one from Slido, is how can the progressive radicalization of French society be stopped? Please say okay. Okay. How can the progressive radicalization of French society be stopped? Um, and radicalization is in quotation marks, so I'm not quite sure what to make uh, of that. Um, yeah, it's because <clears throat> I don't know exactly what what uh, I think the, the person who asked the question had in mind, because um, there is. A conception saying that uh, the radicalization meaning that uh, oh you've got a far left and a far right block uh, and you've got a centrist block in the middle and etc cetera, etc cetera. and as i've explained before it's it's not the wrong it's not the right way i think to 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 look at the problem because radicalization is affecting every block in a way uh this the the policy uh, that aggregated the bourgeois block are pretty radical and not only economic in, in economic policy terms, but also, uh, I mean, during uh, the police repression of the social movement during uh, Macron's presidency has been absolutely incredible. Uh, I mean, never seen before since, I would say, the Algerian war. Um, so, I mean, there is a radicalization, but ra the radicalization is, uh, is not uh, uh, specific to, uh, let's say, the far right or, or the new uh, left bloc. So if we're interpreting the question, how can the radicalization uh, in, in all blocks be stopped? I would say that <clears throat> it will be stopped. It's, it's a question of everybody wants to change the socioeconomic model in a way, in different directions, of course, they, but they want to change it. So, I mean, the radicalization will stop once this is achieved, because there, will, there won't be a need any longer for the implementation of more radical policies, because the radical policies are implemented because they uh, 
um, uh, there is a, a movement towards a radical change of this socioeconomic model. So, I mean, the radicalization is simply the fact that the policy is going in, in one uh, or the other direction is a move towards a radical change of the socioeconomic model. And you could say that um, uh, going, for instance, in the uh, ecological uh, space, uh, you, you could say, well, the Green Party is some sort of a moderate, so blah, 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 et cetera, but not really, because the, uh, what they want to do in terms of ecological change is pretty radical. So, I mean, it is a radical, in a way, times are radical. I mean, you know, global warming is something pretty radical. Um, you, you mentioned that uh, the social uh, um, uh, the social expenditure in France was, was still at, at a rather uh, high level, which is true, but it's not thanks to Macron alone, it's thanks to the policies that were implemented a few decades ago. But once they will do that, uh, the, the change is going, you know, once, once they, they will do what they want to do, um, uh, the changes are going to be pretty radical too. So again, when it is going to stop, when the change is, is, is achieved. Um, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I don't know, uh, I need time to think about what time of, of what book I would recommend. If I had known, because if I had known before, I would have thought of something because I, there is no specific book that comes to mind. And I'm pretty sure that as soon as this session is finished, I, I, one will spring to mind and I would say, Oh God, why didn't I think of that? But um, um, I, 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 I'd send it to you and you can post it uh, uh, after. Perfect, that. perfect. We, we do that, yeah. you send it to me afterwards and then I will tweet it out and, um, and then everyone can, can look at it on Twitter and, and uh, buy it at the next bookshop. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. Um, this has been very, very insightful, at least for me. And I think very interesting for, for, for everyone who came. Um, thank you again for persevering with your voice and sharing your 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 research and your your analysis and and um hopefully hope you talk again soon and um have a good evening everyone thank you